free, our brilliant is that it's been provided by North Wales vegans and Eat Out Vegan Wales. And there is a jar over there by the beautiful Jane there, lovely jar, and we're accepting your donations. Now, there are other things going on throughout the day. The magnificent Badger-esque Mitzi there, waving at you. If you would also like a Badger face, we're doing Badger face painting over in that corner. And also, now Mitzi, tell me if I'm getting this right. There is a photography opportunity, is there not? If you want to see what you would look like, Viewed by a fish. A fish eye view. We've all heard of a bird's eye view, that's old hat. But a fish eye view. Mitzi can make your dreams come true. Now, we are going to hear from the magnificent Roger Yates. And he has asked me not to say too much about him, for I believe he's going to explain himself his uh, raison d'etre. But I will tell you this about Roger. Um, I mentioned I'm a bit of a Johnny come lately to veganism. I've been vegan for five years now. I was born in 1979. I know I look loads younger. Very attractive for a man in his 30s, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. So I was born in 1979. But do you know what? Roger has been vegan since before I was born. How cool is that, eh? Roger has been vegan since before I was born. So um, he's a very, very intelligent, wise, compassionate man with a CV that's full of hugely admirable acts. But I'm going to let him tell you more about that. What I want from you is for you to welcome him to this microphone. So I ask you please, let's give him a lot of love. Put your hands together for Roger Yates. Thank you very much. Okay, I've got a terrible feeling of follow that, really. <laughs> terrible, terrible feeling. Now, uh, my brief then, essentially, is to give you some overview, maybe, of the history of veganism to a kind of non-vegan audience, if you like. So, I'm going to try and do that. So, we've heard some fantastic poetry and a very animated delivery, and... I'm an academic, so you can probably tell that you're going to get a bit of a contrast, so please put up with that. Okay. Now, this is me. Now, what I tend to do if I give a talk is I, I show this slide, and essentially the top part of the slide talks about my academic background, uh, my activist background, and the bottom part talks about me being now uh, an academic. So. I was very involved with the activist side of the 1980s, and I'm now an academic. My MA work was about the British Animal Protection Movement, and my PhD was more theoretical because it looked at the phenomena of cultural speciesism. In other words, the beliefs about how our species is much more important than, than others. And I looked really at the props for that, which are philosophy, theology and everyday social practice. And being a sociologist, I tended to focus on the latter. Now, the reason that I mention an activist past and an academic now is the fact that it means that the range of questions that if you want to ask me can span all that. I'll be focusing on veganism, but if you want to talk to me about animal welfare, if you want to talk to me about animal rights, then I'm quite happy to do that either in the Q&A at the end of this or just approach me uh, anyway, okay. Now this might not be necessary in the sense that this, this is a picture here of Donald Watson. But before that, I always talk about how to pronounce vegan. It's often something that is not pronounced too well. Some people think it's to do with Star Trek and Spock, and uh, something to do with Bagans and Vogans and Vogels and all the rest of it. But in actual fact, we say vegan. Okay, so. Just as with all the poetry, it's uh, vegan is the word. Now this picture is Donald Watson. He was the co-founder of the Vegan Society in England in 1944. And uh, essentially, to understand veganism very simply, 
in linguistic terms, it's the beginning and the end of vegetarian. Right? The first three lessons of vegetarian, the last three, three are vegetarian, so vegan in that sense. And essentially what Watson was trying to do was trying to convince the English Vegetarian Society to have a non-dairy section, and they rejected the idea, and so they realized that they would have to go alone. He also said, in fact, in the picture you can see him reading the first edition of the Vegan News, which you can see online. If you, if you put in the Vegan News 1944, you can see this document online, and also a scanned version of the original, which is really quite interesting, because one of those cassette things, which you, you know, you kind of printed it out, and then you ended up with a sheet full of holes, and then you would print that onto paper. Very kind of primitive kind of idea, but he's reading that, and in that, he says that we are filled with the spirit of pioneers. Now, in terms of the vegan movement, because one of my academic interests is in social movement theory, in terms of the vegan movement, we are all still pioneers. And so I have a blog entry which is called Hello Donald, which means that all the vegans that exist now, we're still really in the pioneer stage. What that means in practical terms is that we're playing something of a numbers game. When I became vegan in 1979, there was not much commercially available for vegans. So everything was home baked at cooking and, and we all talked about the nut roast and all, all the stereotypes. Uh, at the time, the most famous vegetarian restaurant in London was called Cranks. So this, yeah, so that, that was the kind of standard of, of, of things. Now there are vegan things everywhere. You can't go into a shop without being surrounded by vegan products. When I went vegan, there wasn't even any soy milk. There was something called Plamil, which came in a can, and it was made up of brown nuts, which I actually liked. Most people hated it, and I thought it was actually pretty good. But then, uh, I was just I was just happy to be able to have a meal without killing anyone. That's the, that was the main kind of criteria for me. So, we're still pioneers, and we're in a, a numbers game. And when one, once the vegan population becomes larger, it's going to be so much easier for those who follow us. So, you know, I always encourage people not to get downhearted, not to get frustrated because social change is slow unless there's a revolution and we're not in any revolutionary time. And then we've seen that with recession, nobody's banging on the door. And so, consequently, everything will come in incremental steps. But when we get to 10% of the population, then there's going to be actually masses of vegan stuff available to us. So that's what I say about that. Okay, I just want to go through a few definitions of veganism, but I'm going to kind of rush through them in a sense, because if you want this PowerPoint, if you write to me, come to me at the end, I'll send it to you if you like, which have got the definitions of veganism. But essentially, what we're talking about is that vegans avoid all animal products. We avoid all animal products, obviously flesh, eggs, uh, animal milk, I tend to call cow milk calf food. That's, that's what I tend to call it, because that's what it is. It's food for calves. Um, and so honey is also excluded, etc., etc. If we move to the 1960s, we see that there's a more sophisticated definition and um, ideas. Ideas really coming in now about the, the overall scope of veganism, because veganism is really part of the peace movement. It's part of the non-violent peace movement. It's about trying to live in a way that is very light on the planet and is talking about not violating anyone else's rights. So that's what it's all about. And so there is a real base to veganism which is based in the idea of human rights. In fact, if you think about animal rights philosophy, animal rights philosophy is based on human rights thinking. This is the final definition, this is from the 1980s. There was a, an interesting thing because, no, Dominic said, what do you eat? And one of the questions we always get asked is, do you eat honey? Okay, so throughout the 1980s in the English vegan society, they left the eating of honey to personal conscience. It's been firmed up since then, and essentially those who don't eat honey are regarded as full members, and those who do, or 
consume other cat aroma products or their expiring vegans can become associate members. So it's, it's a social movement on the move, if you like, and trying to build itself in that sense. Now these are different types of vegans, and if you can't see the screen, I've got ethical, environmental, health, and for human rights. Now the very early vegans, the 1940s vegans, were ethical vegans. They did it for the animals. In fact, people said, if you go vegan, you're going to die. And a lot of doctors said that to them, a lot of vegetarians said that to them. It just so happens that veganism is an excessively healthy diet as well as everything else. So we've got a brilliant philosophy of non-violence, we've got a brilliant philosophy of peace, and also it's incredibly healthy. Also happens to be very, very good for the environment. Um, the environment thing is quite important. I don't know whether you know this stat, I only learned it a couple of days ago, and it's quite shocking. Something like 490,000 human beings are born every day. 490,000. There's already 7 billion of us, and we're heading for 10 billion pretty soon. On top of that, we have something like 20 billion non-human animals in the world. And it's interesting, you know, when I, I've been doing this for so long, and so many people have said to me, come on Roger, you know human beings are much more important than other animals. And I say, well, you know, say we had two population explosions, we had a massive population of humans, and we had a massive population of non-humans, which ones are more important, which ones, in other words, would you feed? And everybody has always said we should feed the humans. It's not what we do. There are something like 30,000 children who are going to die today of food starvation related issues, food security issues. 30,000 children died yesterday, they will die tomorrow, and controversially, 30,000 children also died on 9-11, which puts it into context because people don't write symphonies for them and they don't expect on an annual basis to remember their uh, lives. So, we politically are much more in favour of providing feed for the 20 billion so-called livestock animals than we are to feed those humans. We can produce enough food for everyone. In fact, it was some academic worked out that we could feed everyone on a vegetarian diet, on a vegan diet, we could feed far more than what we have. And so these are kind of choices that we have to make. The final, the final uh, category is for human rights. And again, some people go vegan because of the fact that they want to feed those human beings. And so they tend to do it for human rights reasons. The ethical vegans tend to blend everything together. They see everything as it's related. And so they will often say, I'm doing it for the animals, but I care about my health, I care about the environment, and I care about human rights. Now, just talking about the modern situation with veganism. Uh, I was active in the 80s, as I've said, and everybody, just about virtually everybody I knew, was personally a vegan. And yet, veganism wasn't really central to our campaigning. Uh, as a sociologist, and as somebody interested in social movement theory, sociologists tend to see social movements as claims makers. In other words, they make claims in civil society. They identify a problem, for example, and they say, something should be done about this. Now, we did that in the 80s about fur, about blood sports, about uh, meat, about various things. We're all vegans, we're anti-hunting and everything else. And yet, veganism wasn't central to our claims making. And now it is, and this is a new thing for the modern movement. Veganism is now established in parts of the movement as its moral baseline. And when I say parts of the movement, the most obvious part is for the rights-based part of the animal rights movement. Now I know that sounds a bit strange to say that there's a rights-based part 
of the animal rights movement, but that's true uh, in the sense that the animal rights movement is rather a mess philosophically, which we need to sort out. But in terms of those who, like me, believe that other animals are rights bearers, and like me, believe that what we do to them routinely and systematically when we use them are rights violations, then it's that part of the movement that sees veganism as the moral baseline. There's been some recent controversies about veganism, about the definition of veganism. In fact, the definition of veganism has been contested since the beginning. So right from 1944, people have been arguing about what the definition of veganism is all about. And in some sense, social movement theory would suggest that this is what we should expect. When the movement gets bigger, then people are going to have different ideas about what veganism is all about. In recent times, people have suggested, for example, that vegans could eat roadkill, or that vegans can eat honey in certain circumstances, they can eat eggs in certain circumstances, they can even eat venison in certain circumstances. And so some people have started to come up with this idea of lacto-vegan, okay, in the same way as lacto-vegetarian. And um, we all know that the definition of vegetarian became quite messy. And I think people in the vegan movement are quite concerned that it doesn't happen for veganism as well. Okay, this is my final slide, my final point. Again, it's, it's part of the claims making of the modern movement. Traditionally, the movement would adhere to the idea of vegetarian being the gateway to veganism. And if you look at the actual academic surveys, there is some academic backing to that. The empirical evidence suggests that most existing vegans were vegetarian first. However, what the new vegan movement suggests is that rather than people go vegetarian and then vegan, what the suggestion is now is that we just try and be as vegan as possible. So if people are moving towards veganism, then they don't necessarily get encouraged now to go vegetarian first. It's not necessarily a gateway argument. In fact, um, I was lucky enough not to go through a vegetarian phase, and I was always very glad about that, in, in a sense. I do know several people who kind of got stuck in vegetarianism. And there is another interesting, the final point I'll make, an interesting point about vegetarianism. A lot of vegetarians have trouble giving up cheese. I did a, I did a podcast recently with a vegan advocate who used to be a, a beef farmer, and his name is Harold Brown. And you can find that podcast on my blog, which is called On Human Non-Human Relations. So if you just Google that, you'll find it. And what Harold says is that we've found something called casomorphine, okay, which is a type of morphine, obviously. And essentially, this is a survivalist kind of evolutionary issue. What it really means is that an infant needs to be attached to their mother in order to crave the food. It's no good for an infant uh, non-human animal to want to wander away. They need to be attached, and so they crave the food because that's the only means of sustenance for their survival. What we do when we consume car food and put it into cheese is we concentrate it. Uh, you know, we increasingly concentrate it and then we produce it ourselves. And so the theory is, this is only a theory and there is some controversy about it, the theory is that vegetarians actually get addicted to cheese. And many vegetarians will actually use that word. I would go vegan, but I'm addicted to cheese. And that kind of thing. Okay, so that's the general overview of what veganism means, uh, how it develops as a movement, how it's developing as a movement, and where it's going in the future. As I said, uh, if there's any points you want to raise, then please do so, or approach me uh, after we finish. Thank you very much.